This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. What we started in 2016, it was the first grant of its kind. It's really to bring a visual awareness to this disease that is so difficult to understand if you have not lived in it. Caring for aging parents or other loved ones while working, raising children, and trying to live your own life? Wondering how to find the time for your personal health and happiness? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast, the show where real family caregivers share how to be happy and healthy while caring for others. Now, here's your host, family caregiver and certified caregiving consultant, Elizabeth Miller. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast on the Whole Care Network. If this is your first time listening, welcome. This is a podcast produced bi-weekly to help family caregivers integrate self-care and caregiving into their lives. Each episode has an accompanying show notes page, so if you would like more details about the topics, products, and resources we speak about, you'll find the show notes by going on the website, happyhealthycaregiver.com, and underneath the podcast menu, click the image for today's show. Join the Happy Healthy Caregiver email list to stay up to date on all the podcast happenings. Every Tuesday, you'll get the weekly roundup, which includes tips under the pillars of happy, healthy, and caregiver, plus upcoming events, special offers, and more. Visit bit.ly forward slash HHCE news to join. Before we get into today's Caregiver Spotlight episode, I want to first shine the light on our episode sponsor. Do you want to earn cash in exchange for your opinion? Researchers recognize that the true disease experts are those living with a condition and their family caregivers. Rare Patient Voice, or RPV, helps connect researchers with patients and family caregivers for over 700 diseases and conditions. For patients and caregivers, RPV provides the opportunity to voice their opinions to improve medical products and services while earning cash rewards. Rare Patient Voice, helping patients and caregivers share their voices. If you're interested, join the RPV panel at rarepatientvoice.com forward slash happy healthy caregiver. After working at National Geographic for 21 years, Gina saw how important visual storytelling can bring awareness to important issues. Gina helped her dad, Bob, care for her mom, Diane, who had Alzheimer's. The Bob and Diane Fund was created to bring a visual awareness and understanding to Alzheimer's and dementia. In this episode, Gina shares her parents' story and how the fund in their names came to be. Gina was definitely a self-care cheerleader for her dad, and she shares how she was able to do this even from 3,000 miles away. And Gina also shares how she had to learn to ask and accept help during her breast cancer journey and recovery earlier this year. Schedule your mammogram and make sure that the others you care about have too. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Gina. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, delighted. Delighted to have you on the um, on the podcast. I know you've done a guest blog post and some other things for us, but I don't know that you've been a guest on the on the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. Y- you're yet. right. I yes, yes, you're right. You're so, right. But we've had we've known each other for a while and we've been keeping mm-hmm. our eyes on each other and you've had quite a year and we're going to definitely talk through that. But first we always kick off the show with um some words of inspiration encouragement from the Happy Healthy Caregiver jar. Would love to get your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, this is a great gift, by the way, if someone's listening for yourself as a family caregiver or someone you care about to kind of just sometimes, you know, we need it right, right when we need it. Um, and it's easily accessible that way. So this says, 
sleep is the best mm. meditation. And that's from the Dalai Lama who we got to listen to everything the Dalai Lama says. I love that. Sleep is so important. How is your sleep these days, Gina? Oh, I, my sleep's usually always good. Okay. Good. Yeah. But I know um, that sleep is so good for your brain care. So um, mm-hmm. that's a great, great saying for, to start this off. Yeah. It's just a good reminder. It's, you know, for the longest time for self-care, it was so focused on nutrition and exercise, but sleep is really deserves just as much attention. Yes, absolutely. So we, especially with the, as we're living longer and we need our brains, you know, we want them to be around for us. So, um, well, very cool. Well, let's, um, dive into caregiving. We're going to talk about self-care and all that, but I, um, I love the story about your parents and you really, you were a more of a supportive caregiver. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. And with your I was di- not the, du- yep. I was not the direct caregiver. So, um, my mother, uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, at 65, which I think is fairly young. Yes. And yeah. And she lived with it for five years. She actually, she died, um, just shy of 71 and her and my father, had been married for almost 50 years and he was a great caregiver to her. I was three, I live in Washington, DC. My whole family's in California, Mm. but I was very active um, and involved, I should say with everything that they did. I spoke to my parents every day. I flew out once a month, almost Mm. I had a very understanding boss. And so I was really able to, um, help with the caregiving, not on a daily basis, like my dad did, which is so different, but I was able to help him and understand what she, what her needs were, but also supporting the caregiver is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just one of the hardest jobs anyone can have. And you worry sometimes more about them than the actual, the person living with the, uh, with Alzheimer's or whatever it might be. It's so fair to say. I mean, I think we have talked about long distance care, remote caregiving Mm -hmm. from afar, but like, you know, you being on site once a month, I mean, I'm sure for your dad, just knowing Jean is coming um, a few weeks was probably a big godsend to him. What are some other things as a remote support caregiver? Yeah. Because I mean, people need ideas. I think sometimes it's like, oh, I'm too far away. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. we've already proven people that we can remote work. So this is exactly this. One thing I did was uh, my dad liked to golf once a week, but he felt like he couldn't get away. So I worked probably a month out at a time and emailed 15 of my mother's closest girlfriends and scheduled somebody a month, you know, every week for a month, I would have it so he could go play golf. So it was a commitment of at least five hours of coming to visit her. And they lived about two hours from all their friends. So um, I was responsible for scheduling all those. So he could have that time to himself and get away. And, um, he just always had guilt about that. I said, you can't have guilt. You've got to get out of the house. We've got one of her dearest friends coming. She will be fine. So, um, that was definitely one of the main things I did, but the other was I called my mom every day and we would just talk about whatever the weather, you name it to give him a break of her being his shadow. Mm -hmm. So he could go into the office and pay bills that he could go and do something without her being on him. So I would try to talk to her, you know, if we couldn't get it for 30 minutes, I would call her three times a day just as a distraction. So he could have that break. So, and I always encouraged her girlfriends to, I said, just call just call, talk about nothing. It doesn't matter, but you know, you have to have thick skin. If she says, I don't want to talk to you and hangs up the phone, you just call right back or yeah, you call 10 minutes day. later, you could try, yes. try again. Yeah. Do not I think take it personally. It's good for you. I think Jeannie, you to, to know that you were managing expectations like that up front, because uh-huh. I feel like the worst things people can do as friends of a couple like your folks is just to just retreat and because it's uncomfortable for us you know as friends we don't show up and um you made that you know easier for them you gave them the exact 
thing exactly. that they could do to help them. Like, this is what help looks like. This is how we can help you. And I'm sure for them, they felt like they were making a difference. Yeah. And I did um, have to explain to them. And the first thing I said really was you need to have thick skin. Mm -hmm. Don't take it personally. This is a the disease. This is not her. And they knew that they knew who she was before the disease, but trying to make them not, not afraid of being around her. Cause yeah, I mean, people do, you kind of see what people are not are capable of, but some people and friends, it's a hard thing to be around. So you have, you kind of know who can handle it, who can't, and those who can't, doesn't mean they weren't good friends. They just, that's a difficult thing we for have, them. We had we different friends for different situations. I feel exactly. like, you know, like, yeah. Um, what will you, I feel like you understood the disease much and maybe you researched it, but, and you knew the, uh, what could happen to your dad and we're doing some preventative things there. Where did that come from? Where did this anticipation I... of. I don't know. So okay. <laughs> my, grand, my grandmother, my dad's mother had it, but we weren't around her a lot. She either was diagnosed quite late or my grandfather hid it for a long time, but she really only lived with it for a year mm. and we weren't that exposed to it. So, and I did, I read one book, the 36 hour day. That was it. I didn't watch movies. I didn't want to read articles. It was too personal and too difficult, but I was just very attuned to what my mom was doing and saying and my dad's reaction. So I handled it very calmly and very differently from my siblings. I have a twin sister. She handled it very differently than I did. Um, she didn't really change her behavior in interacting with my mom. She still talked to her the same way and would maybe get frustrated. I tend to talk, to, I, I interacted differently with my mom mm. because we're living in her world now. And so you have to change your behavior. They're not going to change theirs. Yeah. And I don't have know a broken how brain. I, it's a broken yes. brain. Yeah. I don't know how I was able to adapt so quickly to that. I, I've never really thought about it, but I wasn't experienced with it. I didn't study it. I just um, was very in tuned with how my mom was progressing, reacting, and how I was able to calm her down. Mm -hmm. That's so it's good. It's it's hard to see like once you you know once you know better a little bit like it's hard to watch watch it play out and other people and it's like you but no shame no guilt on y'all like if you're listening and you're like I don't know if I'm doing the right stuff like we don't we we make the best of decisions and we do the best with with the information we have at the time. Um, right. and you know, I'll link to Tipa Snow. She knows how to communicate. She, she put her on the, and the 36 hour day. We'll definitely put that in the show notes too. Um, your parents had this sweet love story. First of all, mm -hmm. they were high school sweethearts. My husband and I also met in uh, high school. He married my prom date. And, um, <laughs> And then your dad, like your kind of worst case scenario happened where even though your preventative measures of making sure he didn't burn out, he got his golf, he got breaks mm -hmm. from you. He made a wish. Um, yes. So tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. So yes, they were high school sweethearts since junior, junior, junior year. Wow. So okay. um, their birthday was seven days apart. And my parents had a good marriage. We had a really good, um, a great family, mm -hmm. great growing up. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, my parents, you know, they used to tell us, they didn't say it exactly like this, but they kind of put their marriage first before the kids. And I've always appreciated that because without a strong marriage, the family doesn't quite, you know, succeed. Yeah. And so they had, they had a good, they had a really good marriage and, um, he was very loyal to her during the illness, took great care of her. She died on Halloween, 2011. Mm. And then three months later, uh, he made it through her birthday, which was February 4th, their first birthday, not together since they were 17. Yeah. Um, and then seven days later on his 71st birthday, um, my brother and his wife took him out to dinner and he, they brought a little dessert out with a candle and he made a wish and he dropped dead 
30 minutes later. Wow. Um, and it was of a broken heart. I'm convinced because my dad had a bad heart. He had rheumatic fever when he was nine. So his heart was never a hundred percent, but he was very active. Um, but he was healthy that day. And I truly believe that he wanted to be with her. Mm. Um, so we lost both of them within three months of each other, which was really difficult. But for me, it was just in a way a blessing. Mm -hmm. I wanted them, I wanted them to be together. And it, I didn't want, I, sorry, I didn't want my dad to grow old without my mom. My mom could have grown old without my dad. Um, but I didn't want him to, and he didn't. It's so interesting. Both of my parents, uh, you know, Gina are deceased as well, but it is comforting, I think, to know that they're hanging out, you know, and, yes. and that they are, they have each other. So mom did meet my dad in high school. So it was her 2.0. She was her first husband passed, but, um, I, I, I think that is comforting for us to, yeah. to know that they're together, especially with a long relationship like they had. Well, mm -hmm. then you, you know, this, this inspired you to start your business, your nonprofit. Yes. Say, yes. Um, the Bob and Diane fund in 2016, mm -hmm. so a few years later, um, and to support visual storytelling that documents Alzheimer's disease exactly. and dementia. And, you know, to get, give us, a, give us the, the notes about how this happened, yeah. how this idea. So it took a few years. Cause like I said, during my mother's illness, I did not um, read a lot. I never watched a movie about Alzheimer's, but then it got easier. And um, I had been working at National Geographic. I worked there for 21 years and I'm a huge supporter of photographers. Um, it's a tough business for them. And I was in a position in 2016, where I had some extra cash and I wanted to do something for, for photographers and give them a grant in some way. And I had mentioned, I was talking with a friend, I mentioned a very random um, way of doing it in a country that may, you know, where people would really appreciate it and need it. And he said, you have no connection to this country. Why don't you do it on Alzheimer's and make it about your parents? And I was just like, how? Have I never thought about this? So that is how the Bob and Diane fund started. And I wanted to name it after both of them because Alzheimer's affected both of their lives. I mean, all of our lives, but really the two of them. And I wanted to honor them. Um, so what we started in 2016 was it was the first grant of its kind. And we give a $5,000 grant to a photographer worldwide. Um, any photographer who is already working on a story related to Alzheimer's or dementia. And the 5,000 is to help them finish it or to help get it published into a book or help pay for an exhibit. And it's really to bring a visual awareness to this disease that is so difficult to understand if you have not lived in it. Mm. And that was really the drive behind it. And working at National Geographic in the position that I was in, I knew a lot of publish publications and photo editors and um, of that kind. And Time Magazine, Time.com announced the grant. And we just did not know if we were going to get three submissions or a hundred. I had no idea what was out there. And surprisingly well first we got a lot of press on the submission because it was the first of its kind so we were so lucky with that but the first year i think we received almost 80 submissions from 30 different countries mm. i mean i was just blown away so well, it knows yeah it knows no race it knows no gender mm -hmm. it knows no geography like right dementia and like two point it, it affects different people what i like too about the photography is versus watching a movie or reading a book it's like you are filling in your kind of your own story and exactly. you're seeing what's relatable and um and just the everyday moments of it it's not mm -hmm. the you know they not the big flamboyant story necessarily it's the the everyday yeah. moments and it's, it could be any type of story about it. It could be your personal story, your parent, your grandparent, your neighbor, a friend. It could be science related. You could do scans of the brain and have it next to a picture of the person living with it. 
there was, it could be about a caregiver taking care of um, somebody with dementia. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. We really looked at the photography. Um, and then once we really liked the photography, then we'd look at the proposal. So, um, so yeah, so the first year in 2016, we have two board members who do the judging, Sarah Lean, who was the director of photography for National Geographic at the time, and Chip Somadavia, who's a um, photographer for Getty Images. And then we had um, a guest judge who was Marianne Golan, the director of photography for the Washington Post. So we're having like people yeah, in the industry. Yeah, doesn't get better than that, Gina. Looking at this work. And which is really amazing because now National Geographic this year has done two online stories and they have come to me both times and said, send us what you have. And I'll send them the names of people whose stories I think would work with them. The Washington Post has come to me and done the same. So it's been really, mm. you know, amazing. But the first year we were published in Time. Um, New York Times, Huffington Post, ARP, I mean, NPR, it, and, and internationally. So the work is really getting out there. And that is what my goal is. That's and that's that. what I Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more than just the grant to your point. Like it's absolutely it's, it's the, you know, reminded me when you were talking about your your what how well networked you are. My dad yeah. used to always tell us that life is a contact sport, he would say. So <laughs> um, yes, it's yes. contacts. I like that. Life is a contact yeah. sport. So I have a lot of dadisms, but that one definitely sticks with me because you know, you just don't know where the relationship is going to take you. Well, you're getting ready to announce your, so to 2022, by the time this podcast come out, all the submissions will be in, you'll be going yep. through your process of choosing the 2022 grant recipient. And then how do you announce the winner? So we, we judge usually the end of October, early November for the last five um, announcements, except for the very first one. Now the Washington post announces our winner every year. We are so fortunate for that. So we announced in November, which is National Caregivers Month. So that's in honor of my dad. Um, we usually have to work around the Washington Post schedule because we mm -hmm. love to get the front page of the health section. That's our goal. Um, so once that's announced and once we have the winner, I then start working on getting who I'm going to market it to, meaning if it's a photographer in Boston, I look for every publication and online publication in that area. If it's someone in Sweden, I am really marketing that area. So I just pull out my contacts and just start pushing it out there and trying to get it as, you know, published online in print as much as possible. I reach out to a lot of the um, dementia, Alzheimer's and dementia community, just for the record, I always say Alzheimer's, but I'm definitely meaning all types of dementia. For sure. Um, yeah. So there's a huge um, community out there. There are so many organizations. So I'm really trying to reach those areas and have them share it with their community. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm a, my book is part of the all's authors community. So they're a great yes. community yes. that people can check out. Um, that, and we've had a gr lot of great folks on dementia, um, talk. So yes, well, we'll do our part. Happy, healthy caregiver of getting the oh, word out there when you. you, with this podcast, and then also with the, with the, um, winner, when it's announced, what as a person who's listening, that's like, I want to be a part of this. I want to help in some way. Like what, how can the listeners, what are the variety of ways the listeners can support the Bob and Diane fund? Oh, thank you for asking that. Well, following us on social media. So we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. That is always helpful. Sharing anything that we put out um, is great. Retweeting and, you know, posts we do, or most importantly, our grantees work. And, you know, if you want to donate to us, it's the Bob and Diane fund.org. And we put that towards the grant. We also, so separate of the $5,000 grant, we do a $3,000 mentorship. Mm. And that is from someone who has submitted. And it's a project that it didn't win. And I don't know if it will, but I, I really like the proposal behind it. And I want to support this photographer. So we will give $3,000 and then they'll work with one of our um, board members for six months to a year to fine tune the project. 
so we give that and then we do some angel grants. Um, there was a photographer who didn't win and she wanted to discuss why. So we did a Zoom call and we talked about it and it was during COVID and she shoots film and it, um, she's like, I have like 12 roles still, but I'm really hurting because of COVID. So I just haven't developed them. And I said, well, how much do you need? And she's like, you know, it was like $300. And I said, oh, well, we'll pay for that because if it's not developed, no one's going to see this work. So I need to get this work out there. Right. So we will do, we'll do things like that. We g- gave a thousand dollars to a woman who was working on a book and she needed some support. And so I love giving just these angel grants. So we, we give about 10,000 a year. And then we've been working with, um, HFC, which is hilarity yeah. for charity. Um, Lauren Miller Rogan and Seth Rogan's organization. And we've been partnering with them for humans of dementia. Mm. And we are doing, um, contests, um, for high school and college. And, photo and written essays. And it's a great, um, program. I yes, really Yes. We'll link like to that, that too. Um, yeah. Call, say it one more time. Humans of, of de- dementia of dementia. Mm-hmm. Yes. I've seen that, but I will link to it. Um, so people yeah. can get more information. Thank you. Go to the show notes. And then you yeah, just going back to your posts, your tweets, like that is how people like, I, it's a very small way. Like if you don't have a dollar, you can re exactly reshare because that's going to help connect people together. And mm-hmm. again, um, we're stronger together. I love and that. also giving to any Alzheimer's organization, but I always say, not everyone, but I'm the most, most people can give two Starbucks coffees. That's what I always write on Facebook when I'm raising money on Facebook, just donates two Starbucks coffees, $10. That's, That's, you know, yeah, just sacrifice two coffees for the week. And um, it it goes a long way. I love it. I love it. What do you think your parents would think about all this, Gina? Oh my gosh. Um, They wouldn't be surprised. Um, My parents were such giving people. They really taught us how to give. And this is my gift to them. Uh, they they wouldn't be surprised by this. They would be totally touched and honored for sure, but not surprised that I'm doing it. Um, it's very much kind of my, yeah, <laughs> my I thing. Th- their legacy lives on through you and yes. then even after, you know, the, through this fund and um, you know, I'm going to link to Bob and Diane's love story, which is on your blog, Aww, which is so sweet. And you. then they, I will link to last year's 2021 winner while we're waiting for um, right. this one to come out. So let's, let's pivot here because you've also okay. like, while this is happening, Gina, like you're, you're doing all these amazing things for photographers, your own health, um, hit a, hit a hurdle. Um, yeah, and I we've and you've been sharing a bit of that on mm-hmm. on social media. But first of all, how are you? What happened? Like, um, if people didn't like you before, they're going to like you even more now. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm doing great. So, in January, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, just of this uh, year. Yes, yes, just this year. Oh wow. Yeah, I'd had the mammogram in October and then I had to go for a follow-up and I kind of postponed that follow-up unfortunately and so I got diagnosed in January and I wasn't shocked because I've always had um oh unusual mammograms like I don't know what the word is but um I always have to go back for a biopsy and a sonogram and all that Mm -hmm. every single time and it's always negative and I do not like mammograms not that any woman ever says they do but they're very difficult for me so years ago um in my 40s I would skip them often because I would have PTSD over the one from a couple years before but in the last I don't know 10 years maybe less less than that I've been going every year. Um, and I was negative a year ago, mm. a year before I should say. So, yeah. So January I'm just diagnosed and, um, they, we decided on a double mastectomy and radiation. And then a couple of weeks before surgery, maybe 10 days, they called and said the cancer was more, pro- was progressing more than they had thought or hoped. And I had to start um, chemotherapy as soon as possible. So I had to postpone surgery till summer and start four months of chemo. Um, but you know, maybe this goes with how I handled my mom. I don't know, but I handled it really well. I 
to me, it was an inconvenience. It really was. But I thought my job had changed. I left National Geographic. Um, life was much easier for me. I didn't have my dream trip to Italy, to Sicily planned. I just had finished that. So I thought, well, if I'm going to get breast cancer right now, I really can fit is this a good in. Time. That's horrible. I, yeah. yeah. I have no, yeah. no trips I'm dying to do. And work was not a problem. And I just said, okay, I let's do this. So I just really was more scheduling people to take care of me during the days where I was down. But um, chemo was not as bad as I thought. Well, good. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. I'm, you know, you see your personality, you can tell is like kind of like roll up your sleeves and dive in. Yes. Like, okay, here we go. And I'm, I can relate to that. That's very, um, uh, we're, we're very similar that way. Yeah. And I'm just curious too, like now, you know, you'd been caring for other people and helping other people and now you're got to prioritize right. your own healing. So yeah. what was that like to have kind of this role reversal in some ways of like, now you're the recipient of the care. Yeah. I actually handled it very well. And friends were like, you need to ask for help. I'm like, Oh, I am. I, I am calling yeah. you to pick me up some groceries. <laughs> so it. yes. Um, a friend had started a meal train for me, which was amazing. She wanted to do a fundraiser. I said, no, I don't need the financial help. And I don't want to take away from other people who could use it. So I was very adamant about that. And, but the meal train was great. And I had so many people donated Grubhub for me, which mm. was really useful. Um, but I your totally taste chains, right? Like, oh my up. gosh. Yeah, completely. I was always, well, not always, but I was hungry, but I had no craving. That was the hardest, not the hardest with cancer, mm -hmm. but that was so hard with figuring out with the eating wise. I just had no cravings. So, um, but chemo went well. And then I took a month off and had the double mastectomy in July. And, um, again, I was really nervous about the pain about being home, being in bed and just being in excruciating pain. And I wasn't good. It wasn't that bad. It hurt because I had deep flap where they use tissue from your stomach as the reconstruction. Oh, and it wow. was done all at the sa same time. So I had a very large um, um, incision in my um, waist. So um, that was, you know, just getting up and getting down. I had it's surgery. You know, it's, yeah, it, 10 it, seconds of pain, yes. and then it would be gone. Well, so. I am grateful that and, and you've given some good tips about how people can support people because, you know, again, we need some people just need to be told like, this is how you know, how you yeah. can help. Um, yeah, but I can't say enough to um, women and non binary women or non binary, I should say, is to get mammograms yearly. They some say every two years is okay. I do not agree because I was negative a year insurance ago. Insurance says that. Yeah. Unless your insurance doesn't cover it and you cannot afford it. I totally understand. But if you can, and it's just something you don't enjoy doing, get your yearly mammograms. It's so important. Um, and I'm just really advocating. I've been posting a lot on social media and two friends who had not done mammograms in a while did it and they have early, can't they got oh, they diagnosed. Did. Yeah. But early. And they were able early. To catch it. Yeah, yes. which makes the difference. I mean, it's yes, it can make a big difference. And mm -hmm. um, I know for me, like, I didn't do a self check for years. And then I started was like, you know, you know, better, you need to do better. And um, what works for me is a reminder on my phone, like it literally yeah. pops up once a month, like, hey, and then of course, my my, my going in to get the mammogram is my I would have found Yeah, I would not have found mine on a self check. You would never felt I never felt it. The doctors could not feel it. Um, so it was only found through a mammogram. Yeah, go, go in. I wish they would make it a less friction um, appointment. Like, I'm like, can't we just like put, you know, I know. Put, like, why does this have to be so painful? Yeah, not fun. Uh, like, I mean, not that it's no. going to be fun, but like, can't we just go put our I know. boobs in something to take a picture. Like why is not somebody, we've done some amazing inventions, people like, or maybe it's out there and we just can't afford to have it. And oh, I would places. donate to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, um, it's every woman would, would donate. It would yeah, only every help woman would. <laughs> because then you wouldn't be like one, you know, 
have this anxiety about the appointment. It's just like, oh, it's just something you do, something you do. I, um, I've also been, you know, on a different cancer front, the reluctant on the colonoscopy, but I have that scheduled. So, and I, I got my mine care. last year. Yeah. So like, just, we're just doing it. Like this is self-care. This is, yeah. this is what real self-care looks like is getting yeah, those and, wellness appointments and, scheduled. And speaking of self-care is really knowing your body as well. If you feel something and you're not comfortable with it, go get it checked. Um, a little seven to 10 days after surgery, I woke up and just something did not feel right. And I woke up my friend who was staying with me and I said, I need to go to the emergency room. And I had two blood clots in my lungs mm. and, um, I knew something was wrong. And I immediately said, let's go get this checked. So not ignoring things is so important. You're not wasting their time. So knowing your body and knowing the red flags and going to get that checked. Yeah. is important. I mean, especially family caregivers in particular are the worst about oh. putting the appointments on themselves because they're yes. running everybody else around to all theirs, but people mm -hmm. like what happens if this ship starts to crumble the rest of the foundation, we are yeah. the foundation like and, two you know, my, earlier, my siblings and I had to talk that what if something happened to our dad before our mom, because he had a bad heart. So we kind of had a plan B in case something had happened to him first, but the caregiver, you have to take care of that person. And whether it's a neighbor who's going through it, offer to do groceries. If it's an aunt who's taking care of your uncle, do, you know, call, ask what you can do. They may not come to you and ask. So you have to go over and ask. And I just can't stress that enough, how important that is. Um, to try to be there for other people who are going through it and taking care of someone. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. Good reminders. National Family Caregivers Month. I mean, I don't know why it's November. It's a short holiday month, but um, it's, and, and think about caregivers all the time, but I, yes. I'm just glad that you're on this side of the, the year that you've been having Gina and you don't have to, you can turn the calendar and kind of put this stuff yes. behind you and I um, get to focus on the Bob and Diane fund. Again, yes. I couldn't really focus on the most of this year. Yeah. It brings you, there's something that brings you joy. Well, with that, yes. let's, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask you some lightning round questions from the, just for you daily self-care journal. So I have some, okay. this is my book that I hopefully helps people prioritize self-care a little bit. Um, let's see. Oh, if you were to lose all your possessions, what item would you miss the most? Oh my gosh. Um, I can't think of one specific item, but it's basically anything that it belonged to my mother um, or my grandmother. My sister and I both just cherish anything we inherited from them. If my grandmother touched a bowl, we both wanted it. Oh, um, so, or you know what? I'm going to go with my mom's Olympic torch. Let me just say she was not in the Olympics. She was the torch. She was the torch runner in 1985. She worked for Wells Fargo bank and they chose her as to represent. They were the sponsor. So we have an, I have her Olympic torch. That's that so is cool. Be, yes. Yeah. And yeah. She was I so love proud that. I love that. Well, um, Atlanta had the Olympics in 96. In 96 is a big year. I, I got married I that my year. Parents. Oh, you did? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, we were at a lot of the events, but the torch, um, I, it did come by. And I remember like we all got to kind of touch it, but to run with it. Yes. That's yeah. And you, you pass the flame, not the torch. So yes. you get to keep your torch. That's mm -hmm. good. We all, yes. I love that. Um, and it's very symbolic. It's like yes. carrying the torch through life. Yeah. Um, so you've had the, some of these, I think, this year, but how do you cope with a difficult day? Um, I cope with a difficult day. Oh, gosh. I mean, people would laugh at this. That's okay. That's I what will, we really want to know here. I will curl up on the couch and put on Law & Order. That law soothes and order. me. Interesting. Law & Order soothes just totally soothes me. I know it's about rape and murder. It's crazy. I go to sleep to it. It just is comfort for me and a, a bowl of popcorn and a Coke on ice. That's <laughs> in law and order. That that's sounds, what does it. It's out. I mean, to each their own. That's the thing. Like, I know. That's why we ask these questions though, because self-care does look differently for everybody, you know? Mm. And so, um, 
I, I get it. Lot, there's a lot of law and order to pick from too. Yes, there is. There's 20 <laughs> over 20 years yes. and I've seen them all. Oh my goodness. Um, all right. This is a four, four thing of looking ahead. What describe what you want to be true in your life at this time next year. So next fall. Oh, um, next fall, healthy, um, definitely healthy. And, um, I, I see it where I am right now, healthy and happy. You know, I, like I said, I've left national geographic after 21 years and have a much easier life. Now COVID taught me a lot. And so I enjoy life much more now. Um, and I want to continue doing that, um, traveling and continuing working on the fund and raising awareness and raising money for Alzheimer's. That's where I want to be in a year. Yeah. I think it's, it's fabulous. It's beautiful. I think the pandemic definitely has taught us a lot of lessons and then you've had mm -hmm. a your own, your own health scare as well. Like that's, that's so big. Well, Gina, how do people stay in touch with you? Learn more. Um, where's the best places to go to find out more about yep. you and the fund? So our website is the Bob and Diane and on there, you could go to grantees and see all the amazing work that we have supported um, over the years. And it's just stunning. Um, it's just inspiring and beautiful photography. And on there also, if you want to submit, even for next year, we do it every year about September 1st, there's mm -hmm. a submission area. And where are in our press, it's seeing all the places that we've been published and podcasts and all of that. It's, um, it's just, you know, we've been very fortunate. So, and reach out to me at Bob and Diane fund at gmail.com. I answer every email and, um, or on social media, please follow us. We are on, um, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and would love to hear from I love People. it. Yes. Yeah. So check it out. Bob and Diane fund.org. Um, I am just so appreciative of knowing you and seeing your oh, work that you, you and like that. I look forward to kind of see, hearing about the next award recipient or grant recipient. And I know lots of amazing stuff to come, Gina, like very exciting. Thank you for making your mark in this, what can be a horrible disease for many yeah. families and and shedding something positive uh, and thank you that. for what you do i mean it takes a village it really does and i really appreciate what you do and thank reaching you. out to me with the blog and doing the podcast and yeah i i appreciate that thank you well i'm glad we got to spotlight your story and i look forward to hearing more from you so thank you so much gina for coming on today all right thank you have a good day you too Thanks for joining us today on the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast on the Whole Care Network. As always, show notes that accompany today's episode can be found on my website, happyhealthycaregiver.com. Just look under the podcast menu for today's episode image, and that will take you to the page with the links and information we spoke about today. You'll also find other resources on the website, along with links to purchase the Just For You Daily Self-Care Journal. When you purchase from my website, you'll get a signed copy and for a limited time, free shipping. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider subscribing to the show on your podcast platform. It really helps other family caregivers find the podcast and you'll automatically receive our bi-weekly shows in your podcast listening queue. Maybe while you're subscribing, consider leaving a five-star rating and review or just simply talk it up on your social channels. Let's stay connected. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Happy Healthy Caregiver. And until we meet again, please take care of you. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.